Good evening, everybody. Welcome to OPN. Welcome uh, the channels that are mirroring us. We appreciate your support and your interest. We're very fortunate and privileged tonight to have retired police captain Ray Lewis from the Philadelphia Police Department here with us tonight. Um, it's a big evening. We have a lot of questions to ask. Uh, we'll be in our usual format. So we'll take questions at the end, and um, I'm going to try to be cognizant of the time, but we want to make sure we have a really uh, solid and informative program tonight. Uh, I want to thank uh, Zena for making the first contact on this, and Captain Lewis was very gracious to respond. So um, we'll just roll on into our interview. Good evening, sir. Welcome to OPN. Good evening, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, I think instead of me uh, giving a small biography, we'll just launch right into to your story. And maybe you could start by giving us a quick introduction to you and uh, a brief overview of your police service. Well, first of all, I want to make clear to everyone that I am a retired Philadelphia police captain. I retired eight years ago, and I moved up to the uh, Catskill Mountain region with my wife to an abandoned farm. And I've been living up here uh, quite content until this Occupy movement came. I joined the police force in 1981, July 20th, and I had a 24-year career, and I retired as a captain. Okay, so that gives us a good overview and uh, 24 years in the Philadelphia police force. Um, just a little bit of prehistory to that. What prompted you to become a policeman? What was your interest and what were your goals in becoming a policeman, your personal goals? Well, I, my personal goals were primarily to interact with people in a meaningful way. I literally had 21 different jobs prior to joining the police department but none of them were rewarding. The uh, paycheck at the end of the week was just not enough. So I realized that I had to get a job, that I was working with people and seeing results. Uh, I ex expressed the term see results, and that means I was working with people in a social environment, children with character disorders, and also with uh, schizophrenics as an assistant therapist in a institution. But after working with these people for a considerable amount of time, I still saw no reward. There was no change in their behavior. And subsequently, that was unfulfilling. Uh, I realized that I could have an effect on a more immediate scale in police work. And the one incident that tipped that off was I was coming out of a bar in Philadelphia. And across the street was another bar. And there was an individual being drug out and unmercifully pummeled by two thugs. I started to run over to break it up and I realized I would soon become a victim. So I stopped and in the most loud authoritative voice I could muster up, I shouted police and then ducked behind a car. <laughs> and they looked around and they, they ran. And then I went over to help the individual. But I realized that if I was the actual police, I could have went over there and made an arrest and even went further in helping uh, someone not be brutalized in the future by these individuals. So that sort of was a little tipping point in directing me towards my career as a police officer. Okay, and during the 24 years you were with the police department, do you feel like you were successfully able to accomplish that, that personal goal? I was successful beyond my wildest imagination. And I say that from the feedback I received from coworkers, from those I managed, and from the people in the community that I served. Excellent. So as, as a police officer, your experience with the community you served was, was mostly or almost clearly positive. You contributed to the community. You got good feedback. And, and you felt like you were doing some rewarding work. And, of course, people responded well to that. Is that an accurate summation? Exactly. And what I liked is the, re the response was so quick. I didn't have to wait a week or a month for the reward. The response was immediate. That same day, that same incident, I got positive feedback from people. And I found that immediate feedback very rewarding. And 
just to help us um, get a sense of the community you served, was it um, a wide demographic or did you serve in an area that leaned towards one demographic or another or was it pretty global? The 19, 20 years of my 24 year career were spent in the most depressed, economically deprived areas of the city. The only years I had in a more affluent neighborhood was my four years as a sergeant. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of a reward after 10 years spent in the ghetto that when I made sergeant, the uh, higher up said, we'll reward this guy by sending him to a nicer area. But what they didn't know is that those four, year, four years were the least fulfilling of my career. I was not as needed as I was in the economically depressed areas. Okay, so that that's giving us a good picture of you, the policeman. So um, you had a successful career. It was rewarding. You retired to the farm. And now we come to what was it that brought you to be interested in Occupy and become an active participant? Well, up here on the farm, I did not read any magazines, newspapers, or uh, corporate media, watch corporate media television. But I did follow what was going on through the internet, internet news, independent media. And here I came upon the Zuccotti Park occupation. I was really taken aback by seeing these individuals enduring such hardships of sleeping on concrete and marble, not having proper bath facilities or eating facilities. And that just inspired me greatly when I realized that they were doing all this and making these sacrifices for social, economic, and environmental justice. That overwhelmed me. The second thing that hit me then was I saw how corporate media was trying to disparage this movement by interviewing those individuals that they knew mainstream America would not relate to. By that, I mean they would interview the individual out of 100 people at a protest, 99 might have been sober, but they would pick out the one that had a little bit too much to drink, perhaps. They would pick out the one with the pink hair, the nose rings, the facial tattoos, and there's nothing wrong with that. I find it a great expression of creativity, but the media knew that mainstream America would not relate to that individual and subsequently pull back from the movement. That outraged me. And subsequently I went down and I sort of put out a challenge to main, uh, corporate media saying, okay, now try to discredit me. Well, good for you for doing that. And, you know, that brings me to my first, uh, actually a tangential question that we'll come back to later. Um, so you went down to the, to the park where, um, in the early days there, were you um, an active resident in the park? Like, did you stay there or were you like one of the daily, you'd come daily or frequently and participate and try to help out in the manner that you chose? And did you from the very beginning start out by wearing your uniform? Well, the very first day I wore the uniform you see here, but with a police hat on. Now, what's interesting is, I got down there late on November 14th. I checked into a hotel, and since it was so late, I said, I'm just going to chill for the evening, take it easy, and I'll go tomorrow morning, which would have been Tuesday morning, all fresh. Mm -hmm. Little did I know that through that night, Zuccotti Park was brutalized. And I did not find out until the next morning, Tuesday the 15th, when I went down to start my protest, and the park was totally empty. They had metal gates around, and they had 100 riot police. Then I realized what had happened. Okay, and so on that day, you chose, um, as I understand it, it, was, um, it wasn't something that you thought a lot about, that you just went, you saw the situation, and you chose to make a statement by your protest. Yes, when I, I went down there, and I met up with some stragglers. They explained exactly what happened. But they said people were going to come back down and march around the metal gates until we could receive a court order to go back inside the park. And I said, OK, that's fine with me. I will march with you around the gates. And I did that. And I then when we got the court order to go back in, I went back in. 
And for that day and Wednesday, I was also down there all day with my sign. It was Thursday, November 17th, that I went down to the protest at Wall Street and got arrested for civil disobedience. Okay, tell us about the sign you, you had and that you've displayed every time you were out, because I think that's important. Okay, my sign says to understand us. And to understand, is this the sign you're speaking of? Right. Okay, to understand us means me and the other occupiers and demonstrators I'm with, watch Inside Job. It's a film about corporate corruption and not 9-11. A lot of people thought it was about the conspiracy of the tw towers coming down. No. Inside Job is about the financial collapse of 2008. And once you watch this documentary, you'll have no doubt what this Occupy movement is about, and you'll fully support it. There's no way you can not support this movement after watching this documentary. It's also a great uh, documentary for occupiers to tell people who don't understand what this movement is about to watch. We've got to spread the word about this documentary. It's one of the most important films I think has ever been made in this for this generation. Um, and, and by the way, it's available. I'm sorry, Mark. It's available free online, which means anybody can have access to it. Even if you don't have a computer, you can go to the library. It's free online at Vimeo.com. V-I-M-E-O. Vimeo.com. You can watch the whole documentary there. Once you get there, just uh, search for Inside Job. And I, I want to second that, too. It's a very well-done documentary, and I'm sure a lot of people have seen it, and some are commenting that they've seen it several times. But it is a dissection of where we came to be and how we came to be here, and it should be uh, required viewing. So um, on the 17th, you were arrested. You protested. It was a nonviolent protest. Your statement was nonviolent. Um, we all remember the imagery of you being in your uniform, being cuffed, and being taken away, which was just the, the cognitive dis dissonance of that image just resonated with, with everybody. Um, just, uh, and I don't know how much you can speak to this, but I, I was wondering how your um, I would say fellow police officers, or however you characterize that, were were you treated well, or were they difficult because you were a police officer and they resented that? I want to start to try to get into the mindset of the of the police officers on on the scene. I was I was treated very well. I was treated professionally. I was treated the way I should have been treated, and so were all the other demonstrators that I witnessed being arrested that day. We were all arrested in a very professional manner. Right. And at that time, did was there any conversation between you and the arresting officers other than the normal procedure? Um, like, did they say, what are you doing this for? Or, or is there any conversation at all? Surprisingly not. You would think there would have been a lot of questions and a lot of officers talking to me, but I had they had no conversation with me whatsoever. Okay. Um, so were you ever formally charged with with any violation and did you have yes, to appear, and you, did you have to appear in court yes and what I, I i was not charged with civil disobedience because there's no such charge but when you commit civil disobedience you're invariably charged with disorderly conduct obstructing the street and failure to obey a police order and I was in violation of all those three. The only thing I don't like is the term disorderly conduct. Uh, that term brings up an image of uh, aggression towards the police, fighting the police. You're disorderly with them. And uh, I'm way too intelligent to fight or disobey any police order. And I also was not disorderly, even to the extent that I did not go limp when they arrested me. I willingly stood up and I walked across that intersection because I did not want to make the police job any harder than it was all, already was. Okay. Um, so you were charged, and did you have to make a court appearance, or was it one or uh, – if this is in an area you can't talk about, I would understand. No. Okay. That's fine. I was – yes, I did get a court appearance January 17th, and at that time I uh, pleaded guilty to uh, the, the charges, 
and I was giving what you call an ACD, and that st ACD stands for Adjudicated Contemplating Dismissal. Contem contemplating dismissal, meaning that if in six months I don't get arrested again for anything, they'll dismiss the charge. That six months just passed last July 17th, so I'm free now to uh, commit any other to, civil dismissal. Yeah, to, good to go, right? To, to yeah. <laughs> rewind. Um, maybe I had this further down on our discussion, but um, uh, first of all, I admire the fact that, that you did plead guilty to the charges um, because I think that actually reinforces the, the act of protest. I mean, you consciously made a statement. You consciously accepted responsibility for it, and the chips fell where they may. But I don't know what anybody could have predicted is some of the peripheral fallout from that. Um, and I think it's important for our viewers and chatters to know that more than anyone, that you, you personally haven't gotten a free pass. So I'm wondering if now would be a good time for you, if you're able to, to speak to some of the issues involving the union and um, what appears to be a, quite a struggle with them surrounding your actions. If I have time, I'll also comment on the uh, response from the Philadelphia Police Commissioner. But first, the union. I got a very threatening letter about a week after my arrest from uh, my union, the Fraternal Order of Police. Uh, different cities call it by different names. For instance, in New York, they call it the PBA, Police Benevolent Association, but they all basically are the union and they do our bargaining force at contract time. I received a letter from the union stating that Henry Vanelli, the pension director, had filed a grievance against me due to my actions at, in, New, in New York City and that they were going to have a hearing on that grievance, uh, and I was asked to attend. And I know one, the one reason they got Henry Vanelli, the pension director, involved is because of the fact that they thought, wow, they may mess with my pension. That's the last thing I can have happen, and they thought I would just slink away and never be heard of again. Instead, I took that letter and I put, I put it out as a press release so everyone in the world could see what they were trying to do to me. Excellent. And as I understand it from my research, that's still an ongoing issue that you're having to contend with, yes? Yes, that's an ongoing issue uh, because they're going to lose either way. If they expel me from the union, that's going to make national headlines, and they don't need that. If they come out saying, uh, Ray, Ray, we're not taking any action, then it looks like, well, why did you even bring this up in the first place? Now it looks like they're backing down. So what they're going to do is just let this die and not come out with anything else that would cause publicity. But let me tell you the real reason behind that threatening letter. They thought, and in, in discussion, I heard, and in, in John McNesby is the president of the FOP. In his statements to the press, he said, I disgraced the uniform and that I should be arrested every time I step, in, step inside Philadelphia with a uniform on. He said, I disgraced the uniform. Now, let me say, I, I believe I honored the uniform. Let me go one step further. Right now, there are at least two officers that I know that committed child sexual abuse while they were on the job. They, one is still in prison. The other was released from prison, is on parole. They were both convicted. The FOP never threw them out of the union, and yet they never even had a grievance towards either of these officers, and yet they filed a grievance towards me because I was disgracing the uniform. You can see what a farce this is. Now, let me tell you the real reason behind this. The real reason is John McNesby runs to become the president of the union just like any other politician runs to be elected to office. It takes money and plenty of it. There's several men that want to be president of the union every election. And you get all these mailings, three and four mailings before the election, say, vote for me. I will do this, this and this. Some of them, the ones that get more money into their coffers, they come out with the glossy, colorful ads. I'll do this and this. They put ads on the radio. This is all a tremendous amount of money. 
that money does not come from their back pocket. It comes from contributions from corporate America. It comes from financial institutions in Philadelphia. Subsequently, when my actions against the financial institutions was highly publicized, John McNesby, president of the Philadelphia Fraternal Order Police, sided with the financial institutions. He knows which side his bread is buttered on. And he let them know, listen, guys, I'm going to try to shut this guy up. That's the real story behind the letter from the union. Um, and I want to compliment you on appropriate use of media because releasing the letter to the media was just a brilliant a brilliant step. Um, yeah. you're, you're clearly not a man to be trifled with. So um, I, I really ad admire that. But the point I wanted to make with that for all the viewers and chatters is that with with choices came accountability and responsibility and uh, um, I don't believe Mr. Lewis goes goes into this lightly because he's he's put his you know entire career on the line and the benefits from that career of having service and his position is that clearly I mean because of your action that it's a reasonable risk because you're trying to help move things forward not to put words in your mouth if that's not right you can correct me um, so so that's good I wanted to um, can you tell us what your current level of participation in Occupy or the movement for social justice is how are you actively involved now I know you were at NATO we saw it and our friend punk boy uh, got a chance to meet you so um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing now in the movement I'm basically going to a whole bunch of different events. Everybody wants me to attend their event, and I'm trying to attend as many as possible. I'm attending events also not only in New York City, but Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., and uh, uh, Occupy Delaware, Wilmington, Delaware. My uh, participation in Philadelphia was for two foreclosures. Uh, they were foreclosing on two homes. I was out there with other occupiers and other committed individuals. And we were able to put off the one eviction uh, for a couple of weeks, but unfortunately she was eventually evicted. The second eviction, we were able to come up with money from the neighbors to get a stay uh, from eviction. And she's now working on re uh, has, uh, not everybody, but a lot of people have the uh, equipment to do something like this. And subsequently I'm very willing to participate. I was just down last Wednesday, Al Jazeera, uh, flew me down to Washington, D.C. I did a show down there called Inside Story. That was July 25th. And if you go to aljazeera.com uh, and search for Inside Story, July 25th, it's about the police brutality in Anaheim. So I'm doing a whole bunch of different things uh, in regard to my participation. Okay, great. And just as on a personal note, will you be coming to the DNC in Charlotte this year? The Democratic National no, Convention? No, I will oh. Um, no, I won't. Uh, I don't have the I don't have the funds for a lot of this, and I also am wondering. I still am trying to feel out my, what my exact role is in this movement, and my basic role in coming down was twofold: one, to show these occupiers that I support you 100 percent, and two, to show mainstream America that a law enforcement official does back this movement. It's not a bunch of crazies and yellers and screamers. And I'm trying to get mainstream America to watch this uh, documentary Inside Job. I don't know how much I want to go out and be involved in uh, Republican and Democratic national conventions. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, I was asking from a personal interest because I'd love to meet you person to person. So, <laughs> and, uh, so that was purely, purely greed on my part. Um, uh, selfish. Yep, self-serving. Um, I want to get in a, a little bit about um, sort of, you know, as we've been promoing this, I'm saying, okay, Captain Lewis has the unique, you know, observation point of having been on both sides of the protest lines. So um, first, first question is, during your tenure with the Philadelphia Police Force, were you ever part of policing a protest? Yes, I was, Mark, but not the major one. Uh, the major one was the RNC convention in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and I was not part of that because they, at the time I was in charge of a district, 
and they were not pulling captains away from their districts. The, and other than that, Philadelphia during my tenure had nothing like the demonstrations that are going on now. We didn't have such a movement. Uh, the closest I came was as a patrol officer, I and others were sent down to South Philadelphia to guard a uh, housing development that was going to be used for Section 8 housing. And a lot of the residents of that neighborhood were against it. And they formed across the street, uh, 40 or 50 of them with signs, bullhorns, and some shouting, uh, because they did not want the Section 8 housing in their neighborhood. We were on the other side of the street, and basically we were there to stop them from vandalizing the new development being built. Mm -hmm. And we had no, we didn't even have helmets on. We showed up in our regular uniform, in our regular uh, day-to-day equipment. There was nothing like I'm seeing today. And that leads me to the next question. Are What are your general observations about the police behavior in cities nationwide? Um, is the uh, Are the tactics they're using um, typically traditional police tactics in that kind of environment? Or have you seen a change relative to how it was in, in your career? in your training and experience uh, between then and now? Has there been an evolution in tactics? Absolutely there has. It is much more militarized. The equipment, these officers, are, they're, they're like robots. They're covered from the steel tip toes in their boots, up their shins, their thighs. Their whole body is encased in this body armor. And their helmets are top-notch, uh, take a very strong ballistic uh, bullet to penetrate. These guys are ready for war, and I don't see why. The Occupy movement that I'm involved with, that I've seen, they are not violent. They are peaceful people, and what you're doing is these, um, these officers dressed like this are really scaring away a lot of your people, your mainstream people, your teachers, your nurses, your carpenters. These people are fearful of facing such a, uh, a a bunch of armed individuals, and they're staying away from these protests in droves. And I know that because they're telling me that. Right. Um, so the follow up to what is the deal with that? Because the the one of the largest lessons that I've gained personally over over the last you know nine or ten months is the completely unreasonable and disproportionate amount. Of, of a show of force in almost every situation, which typically is fairly benign, it seems like. But I remember back in December, a, a small march of maybe 100 people in Atlanta, and I cannot remember. I mean, I, I would have never guessed. that There was a tank. There was a, a whole flanks of mounted policemen. There were hundreds of uniformed policemen marching in formation in the street, and I, w I, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. It looked like something out of a movie. So what is driving that mentality? Who is making those choices? Where is that I'll coming from? What, what, where is that coming from? It's coming from the 1%. It's coming from corporate America. They are very fearful of this movement because it's directed at them and they've never seen anything like it before. And what controls the police department is are the mayors. The mayors control their police department. Who controls the mayors? The contributors. Who are the contributors to the mayor's elections? Corporate America. So this is coming down from politics of each individual city that they want this movement squashed. The police departments have never seen anything like this. And they're fearful of not being able to control it. Subsequently, they're going back to uh, the basic rule that before you enter any type of confrontation, you have to make sure that you have an overwhelming number of forces to ensure a victory if there is a confrontation. That's why you're seeing this disproportionate amount of officers compared to the occupiers. They, are try they want to make absolute sure that if there is a confrontation, they will be victorious. And I, I give them credit. Mm -hmm. You have, as a police department, you have to have an amount of officers that they're, if they're ever in a skirmish, they are guaranteed to win. Um, so, 
that all that all makes sense. Um, but what? And, and I can I can almost get my head around it when they assume a defensive posture. One of my concerns is you see more and more that the police forces in the cities, the various cities. Um, the the one that has really baked my noodle of recent is Burlington, Vermont, because because I have marched on those streets. I knew exactly where they were. I knew how many people were there, and and I also know there's not that many policemen in Burlington, Vermont, and they were there, decked out in full riot gear with weapons, pushing people. It, it was it was a small benign group. So what that was had to be. You know, for the most part, it's Ben and Jerry's, for God's sake. You know, it was a non-threatening thing. So why the aggressive and provoking behavior? Is that, a, is that an intimidation tactic that's being leveraged? Or can you speak to that? More, I think it's more a lack of training, that, that these officers have not been trained to uh, handle such a demonstration. And, and two things always strike me when I see a video or still photographs. In New York City particularly, Every video and photograph I see, I see white shirts involved in the fighting. I saw a video just the other day where there were two white shirts, not just one, but two white shirts affecting an arrest. White shirts should never be affecting an arrest. That should be delegated to a blue shirt. The fighting has got to be delegated to a blue shirt. You have white shirts involved in the fighting and making an arrest. Well, guess what? Who's supervising? White shirts are paid and trained to supervise, and they can't be involved in the physical fighting or making arrests, because then you have no supervision and you have this chaos. The other thing that strikes me when I say, especially in Anaheim, it's either that there's too many white shirts involved in the fighting, or I don't see any white shirts. So if you don't see any white shirts, who's again, who again is supervising? And without supervision, you have chaos, especially when these officers are not properly trained. Okay, and you know that brought up my. Um, I want to go to the mindset of the officers in the field, the blue shirts, um, for the ones that you still stay in contact with and know. Um, can you give us a glimpse into what are what are they what are they thinking? Because you know I've been all over the map, and early on I'd say, okay, we cannot do we cannot discuss this in institutional abstracts because that's not fair because. There are going to be good people and there are going to be bad people. Um, then the question always arises, then why doesn't a blue shirt make a choice? Which seems to be pretty obvious. It's driven by economics. But I was wondering if you could speak to the mindset of, of a group of officers out in the field in these kinds of situations, as far as you know. The one thing that's always drummed into you from the first day of the academy is that you are there to enforce the law. You are enforcing the law constantly is pressed into your mind. And at these demonstrations, the officers are under are told we're enforcing the law. If you cannot march in the street, if you don't have a permit to march in the street, don't march in the street because the officer getting you out of the street is then has that in the back of his head. I'm enforcing the law. And you can't and they should be enforcing the law. And subsequently, the prime uh, motivating factor of a lot of these officers is that they're doing what they were trained to do, enforce the law. Many times, and I've been a witness to this, the protesters will violate the law, especially on these marches. I was going to take part in a march. I asked them, do they, is it going to be on the sidewalk or the, or the street? They said, well, it would be if you want to be on the sidewalk, okay, or if we're on the street, okay. I said, well, okay, on the street, do you have a permit for that? And they said, no. Right away, I pulled it back from that march because of the fact that it's not right to put the police in that position. Fortunately, this was in Philadelphia at the National Gathering, and the police, using, the better, uh, using discretion, allowed them to break the law by marching in the street. And they realized that was uh, something they could handle, although they, they didn't want to be shown in that manner that they were allowing this illegal act. They were willing to do that. And I commend them for that. But you can I also would understand if they pushed them up on the sidewalk. You cannot interfere with traffic like that. It's not right. 
You have emergency vehicles that need the right of way. You have other civilians that have to get places. You have got to respect the motorists. You have got to respect the law. And you can and be as just as uh, meaningful a protest by marching on the sidewalk. If anything, I think you devalue your protest by marching in the street and getting everyone, all the motorists there, unhappy and ticked off with what you're doing. I also saw people walking the sidewalk when it's very loud and raucous and the drums are beating and screaming and the obscenities. I saw people on the sidewalk being fearful of the protesters. So to me, a protest on the sidewalk is even more meaningful than marching in the street. So it all gets back to the officers have got to uh, enforce the law. The second thing about these officers at protests, a lot of them are in special units. You will see them, they're SWAT units, they're bicycle units, they're community relation units. You want to leave your patrol officers in your districts to handle all those 911 calls. You don't want to take them out of their districts. So you bring in the special units. Guys in special units do not want to leave that, get thrown out of that special unit. They waited a long time to get into that special unit. They worked a long time, and they're not going to risk getting thrown out. The slightest apprehension about doing what they're told to do could get them relegated back into patrol where they're ri riding around answering 911 calls. So you have a bigger commitment from those officers at the demonstrations because primarily they're from special units. So there is... Um like in so many other cases, an an or overarching um, overarching investment in conforming to the rules of of the unit or of the force, um, and when the police officers are in the field, primary job is to enforce the law, whether or not they agree with it. Much like the military, you follow the Correct. order. Okay. Correct. But but mostly they do agree with these laws. I mean, if the if the I, I can understand and I would fully feel comfortable enforcing a protest back on the sidewalk if they did not have a permit for the street. Okay, okay, good. All right, that that's good because I'm making the distinction of what seems reasonable and not reasonable. And um, so I I mean I can even tell you what we're seeing off the chat right now. Some people are questioning. Well, what about our our rights to assemble freely? And you, know, this you have is, that right. Yeah. Right. You can assemble freely in a park. You can assemble freely on the sidewalk, as long as you don't block pedestrian traffic. You can assemble in a street, but it's only common sense that you should have a permit because you are going to disrupt motor traffic. It's like saying, could you? Protest in front of a hospital doors, in emergency doors. Mm -hmm. No, you don't want to block off emergency doors. And you mentioned something very important, Mark. You, you use the term reasonableness. All of law is based on reasonableness. And I find it reasonable that you can still maintain your demonstrations more effectively by not blocking traffic, more effectively by not blocking pedestrian traffic, than you can by doing that. Now you may say, well, Captain, why did you participate in a civil disobedience that was blocking traffic? And I did that to bring attention, and it was quiet. I was not screaming. I was not shouting at the police. I was not using any obscenities. I got up immediately and walked off. I didn't put up any fighting. That was to show solidarity with those individuals that were doing it. I just was so inspired by them that they were willing to sacrifice their freedom, they were willing to sacrifice their personal welfare, that I had to show solidarity with them. And that's why I participated in that that day. But any other time, I think that we're hurting our cause by turning mainstream America off. And when you have a loud, raucous crowd marching through streets that looks like total chaos, uncontrolled, you're scaring mainstream America. You're not making them want to learn what you're protesting. Um that that was a, a great overview. I just want to interrupt for a minute and let the chatters know that um, if you guys can be be patient, we will take some questions. And um, this this is you know an important conversation, 
And it's not necessary we agree with everything, but it's to try to become educated and informed. So if you can hang on, I will absolutely ask your questions. And Captain Lewis has indicated he's willing to take any question that, that is offered. So everybody will get a, get a chance. We get the marching in the street things, getting people a little heated, you know. <laughs> so, and I, I, I have both sides of that, you know, in, in my head, too. Um, and I think maybe it's a good time. You, you've referenced so many times mainstream America, mainstream America. Um, this is one of the questions I have, and this is one of my observations of, of not only Occupy, but a lot of movements for social justice. How do we reach out to mainstream America? Because nothing is ever going to get accomplished unless we we get, you know, I always use blue-haired Aunt Tilda in Kansas City. And blue-haired Aunt, Aunt Tilda is threatened, is threatened by a lot of what she sees. So how, as, as a movement, do we reach out to those people, that we bring them in, that we give them a sense of safety and inclusion and that we have good intents and we do mean well? Um, what's your observations on that? May, how to bring mainstream America into along with us? My first, my first comment is we cannot make them fearful of our protests. And I'm open to discussion on this. I'm even uh, willing to change my mind on it. It's not set in stone. But from my personal observations, these loud banging on the drums, the screaming, the obscenities, uh, the, the disobeying the law by marching against uh, in the street and sometimes against traffic, which is even worse. These things turn off mainstream America in a flash and we need them on our side desperately. And I th and it's so to me, they're so ripe to join this movement because they're all victims. And if we can just get them over that fear factor of this movement and look at what we're saying and what we're saying can be held up on signs. And none of that, uh, you know, FTP stuff on signs and whatnot, that's not going to bring in mainstream America. And although I'm prejudicial with my sign inside job, but you can have a book. And how about we have a little more creativity in these protests? We can have people going down the street singing a peaceful song and a more, more up-to-date song even, not uh, We Shall Overcome necessarily, well, come on, there's so much creativity in this generation. Let's have another peace song that people enjoy listening to. They enjoy the lyrics. It's a catchy tune. It'll attract people, not drive people away. Then we can have handouts and we can have signs. And perhaps instead of having 20, 30 different signs, perhaps we can have 30 signs that all say the same thing. And that will really, if people here see 30 signs all saying the same thing, then you know what? Maybe I should buy that book or maybe I should watch that documentary. But when you have 30 different signs, and some of them are witty, but they really don't teach. I'm for teaching. So let's have these protests teach the people that we want to reach. Um, that, that just hit home for me because I'm, I'm all about the, the, the teaching and, and using, you know, using the smarts to overthrow the systems and to and challenge we, them. This movement has plenty of smarts. It's a, an incredibly intelligent generation, incredibly intelligent generation. And I'd like to see a little bit more creativity in these protests. Um, me too. I mean, I'm an artist, right? So I think we could do a lot, you, you know, a little bit of, um, you know, satire and irony and humor and that because that's welcoming and it, it's non-threatening, but you can still make your, your statements and your positions very effectively. Um, what accountability do police departments generally have to the community they serve? They should have 100% accountability because you mentioned a good word again, serve. We are civil servants. We are not the ruling class of the community. Too often a police department thinks they're the ruling class of a city or a town. Uh-uh. We are the servants to the people and we serve the people. Accountability is essential. And unfortunately, there is very little, if no, accountability in many of these cities. And so that being a given, I mean, even in my little mountain community, same same thing, the police and the sheriff's departments pretty much do what they want without any accountability. Um, 
So as a citizen, what do, what do we do about that? How do we address that? We know what the you problem what is. The, What's the solution? You do what the citizens of Philadelphia just did. First of all, every town or community needs a civilian review board. That's a board made up totally of civilians, doctors, lawyers, school teachers, carpenters, electricians, plumbers, you name it. They're on this board. What they do is they oversee the investigations by the police department's internal affairs department. The internal affairs department does the initial investigations and they come out with their findings. The civilian civil review board, they review the findings of the internal affairs bureau and they decide whether or not they should go to the mayor and complain about it or whether they accept it. The Philadelphia citizens were so fed up with the president of the civilian review board that they they got rid of him and they replaced him with someone else because they felt that that individual became a little too cozy with the police commissioner. And subsequently, in a whole year, there was not one major case that was reviewed. The citizens of Philadelphia said, uh-uh, enough is enough. He's got to go. We need someone new. Subsequently, you have to have civilian review boards, active civilian review boards in any city or town reviewing the police department's behavior. Um, I, I, love, I love that idea. How many does a city such as Anaheim – which is going through just all kinds of problems now. A city such as Oakland, which is historically embattled with their police department, how do those do those communities have such things? Are they effective? If they don't have them, what can be done to to start them? Is that a social or a political move? Uh, how does that work? I don't know if those cities have them or not, but the uh, community is responsible. The community has got to be involved. The community cannot just sit back at home, watch television, and say, well, we need a civilian review board. You have to, as a civilian, have to get out there to your community meetings and be part of that system. It's not going to be handled unless you become active in it yourself. Okay. Um, so taking along you know, personal responsibilities in our situation, and if there isn't something available, creating it out of thin air by being a responsible well, citizen. You got to start from the ground up and creating it. You, mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the the foundation is a lot of concerned citizens. Excellent. You have a lot of concerned citizens. You go to your city council member. You go to your mayor, and you say, "This is what we want." And if and if they're not agreeable, then you start your protesting against your city council members, your mayor, to get a civilian review board. Um, at what point is it reasonable for protests to change to resistance? To change to resistance would be a very, to me, a very small uh, number of cases, and you'd have to sp cite a specific one. And I'll tell you why. Once you start resisting, you're asking for big trouble because you're not going to win. You're going to get extreme physical uh, force against you. You cannot overcome that, and you're going to have a lot of, lot of injuries. So trying to resist what the police are telling you to do, I think, would be foolhardy. And what the one thing you can do, though, is document what they're trying to tell you to do document with uh, everybody has these cameras now that can film film their actions write down the names and badge numbers of these officers so that you can later address it in a court of law that the writing down of names and badges the filming of this police police actions in new york was instrumental in that study by the four law universities in coming out just recently with a study that totally condemned the nypd's handling of the demonst the Occupy movement, that was they were able to come out with that study due to all the information they received from occupiers and protesters. Subsequently, you have to document what's going on, and I see it's trying to physically resist as you're asking for trouble. Okay, um, and and I I don't mind saying you know I try to maintain a neutral position in these. But it, just looking at it from a purely pragmatic standpoint, I can't understand 
how resistance can be successful. I mean, statistically, the odds are against you. You know, there's there's more training, more weapons, more money, more everything, and no matter how the people band together, direct physical conflict is probably not going to result well in the people. But that's just my particular opinion. <laughs> Well, the, the other the other very important thing there, Mark, also is something that co- you can guarantee corporate media is going to have a field day videotaping all the confrontation of protesters with the police and relaying that back to mainstream America. And while here's the here's the overriding problem with that. While we're fighting the police, while we're demonstrating and, and uh, shouting at them. Corporate America, the one percent, they're having wet dreams. They love the fact that the fight is against the police and they're not we're not shining the light on them. They're happy as can be. And we're playing right into their hands when we're confronting the police. Look how much time we've just spent talking about confrontations with the police. Mm-hmm. The one percent are loving this. Right. Um, which you know, brings up my a statement I say all the time that I personally don't believe the problem is the police. The pro- that's the symptom. The problem is the one percent pulling the strings. Um, for for what that's worth. Um, so I'll move on to accountability. Um, maybe a little bit of helpful solutions to people who are actively involved in protests. What specific actions and responses can a protester take on the scene when they are harassed or abused by a police officer or if they're arrested using unreasonable force? What action can a protester take? Okay, first of all, you want to do everything possible to avoid the harassment or the arrest. And so often I have seen protesters they put up a fight when they know their rights are being violated. And I saw the police telling them to move back, let's say, and they did not have to. Legally, they could have stood their ground and they were standing their ground. You have to understand you're going to lose. You can stick up for your rights. You can know you have the right to assemble there, but you're going to lose by trying to hold your ground. You have got to deal with that violation of your rights later Because at that point in time, the only rights you have are the rights the police officer wants to give you. And if he does not want to give you the right to assemble, move back. Because standing your ground and holding still to your rights is not going to uh, make the situation any better. It's going to make it worse. Violence is going to break out. You're going to be arrested. And you may be released later. But the fact is, it was a situation that did not have to occur At that time, make sure you have plenty of people recording, videotaping, getting names and numbers, uh, talking about what is going on, that they're making you move back and out of your your free zone to uh, protest. Then handle that in a court of law. That's what was so important in this four uh, university study. They had the documentation. Document, document, document. Okay, there's our... um solutions that we could we could incorporate into our toolkit so um, if you do you have any other thoughts and points you would like to make and then we're going to open it up for a few few questions from the uh, chat stream I would just like to get in a uh, little plug for my two Facebook uh, pages I have a Facebook page Captain Ray Lewis this was started by an individual in California who was very smart and very uh, kind to take out this Facebook page for me within hours of seeing me the first day of Zuccotti Park. He did that because he did not want to get it, let it get into the wrong hands of somebody who would use it against me. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's my fan page, Captain Ray Lewis. To access my fan page, I had to open up a personal profile page, and that's Ray Occupy Lewis. So Ray Occupy Lewis and uh, Captain Ray Lewis, if you would please check it out. And if you like anything on there, please share it, because if we can share these stories and get our message out, uh, the message grows exponentially. And that's very important for any type of movement. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, the um, facilitators are posting those links as we speak. And as we said, we're going to be sharing links um, in the pad. So um, 
I want to encourage the chatters to ask some questions now. Um, I know some of you have um, some comments and you disagree with uh, some of the issues. So um, let's let's go ahead and ask them. Take your spots and uh, put them in bold so I can see them. So somebody asked about your early education. Like, what was your early education? You go to public schools or private or? Um, yes, I, I I went through uh, public schools, and then I have a degree, bachelor's degree in psychology. Bachelor's degree in psychology. Um, you said you were given an ACD in court. Was that because of your status as a retired police officer, or can any protester nego negotiate for an ACD? All the protesters that were arrested with me that day, if they pled guilty, received the ACD. Okay. i got to pause this because the questions are flying. <laughs> um, what is the what is the police's hold on? i got somebody needs to... Can one of you guys pause this for me so I can keep up? Um, what is the police's, the general police's official position regarding corporate corruption, or, or do they even have one? Unfortunately, they don't have one. And my whole thing is if you, you should invert the pyramid of law enforcement. Right now, you have at the bottom of that pyramid almost all your entire police force fighting street crime. You should have that pyramid inverted so that almost your entire police force is fighting white collar crime because all street crime invariably is the result of white collar crime. Uh, exploitation, discrimination, these these are the reasons you have crime at the street level, and that all comes from the 1% the white collar crime. And uh, I, I want, let's repeat that. That's really important because that was totally truth sauce that the street crime is a result of white collar crime. Invariably, if it's traced back, you'll find that to be true. Excellent. Um, here's another great question. In light of the recent police involved shootings across the country, is there something that you personally would like to say to the law enforcement officers that might be watching this, this channel? Yeah, I would like to tell all the law enforcement officers that these are peaceful demonstrators. They do not represent a threat to you. They are not armed. They don't even have knives. They are asking for change that will be in your benefit. Right now, all across the country, all of these officers are having their benefits slashed. And they, I, I'm asking all the officers to realize you're part of this movement and you're the 99% and we're fighting actually, in, our fight actually includes help for you. Thank you for that. Um, I think it's an important distinction to make um, that, that that is inclusive. And I firmly believe that, you know, you drew the relationship between corporate through politics down to the ground level police officer. And when push comes to shove, the ground level police officers are at the same risk everybody else is. They could be your pen, you know, lose their pensions, lose their jobs, lose everything. And so it would be, you know, really good for them to acknowledge that and then help participate in the change. Um, that's just, an, I'm pontificating an awful lot. No, um, no, no, you're not. That's absolutely true. Um, we have a viewer that says they believe that they have footage of agent provocateurs that are used to give Occupy a bad name and stimulate and inflame confrontations. So this is video footage. And so they're asking what should they do with that? Is should how what should they do with that? They have this information. Who do they give it to or what should they do with it? Every Occupy, every organization should be associated with some legal guild, whether it's the ACLU or the National Legal Guild they have to be associated with a legal organization to help them and uh, uh, deal with many of the arrests they encounter and also to deal with many of the police actions that they uh, encounter. So you have to be associated with something like that, and all that information should be handed over to them. Okay. So uh, try to find your legal guild and associate with it and make them aware of whatever documentation Absolutely. you have. Absolutely. That's a critical part. That's a critical part of this. And as a as a one of the you, 
users of the digital movement make copies of everything. <laughs> just, just, Always. Yeah. Um, another question, Occupy Oakland has put together many videos and presented, presented it to their city council, which are ignored. And so what can they do? They've gone through the process. They presented information. Here's what we're seeing. Here's what's happening to us. It's completely ignored. What's their next step? Are we back to the legal guilds and things again? Well, uh, first of all, I want to I want to empathize with that. That's extremely frustrating when you get that information, when you document it, and you take it to your elected representatives, and they don't do anything with it. And that's of course because they're controlled by the one percent. So you ha you might want to pull some demonstrations right there in front of city council and let people know that city council is totally dropping the ball on this. But in the end, you're going to have to do it in court, unfortunately, that you're going to have to have your legal guild or ACLU present all this stuff that the uh, city council people don't want to deal with. You're going to have to have that presented in a court of law. The problem there is it takes a long time, it takes a lot of patience. But if that's what need, what's, is needed, we'll show it. OK, great. Um, so we're restarting the chat so that I caught up. Um, so this seems like a pretty elementary question, but um, I think I want to throw it out there anyway. Do Are the police sworn uh, – hang on, I'm having a little technical problem. Do you think the police should defend the Constitution? Absolutely. There, there's no doubt about it. Now, there may be misinterpret uh, – not miss, but uh, various interpretations of the Constitution – that we would have to talk about. I don't know exactly which one they may be talking about. Okay. Uh, let me pause this again. Pause, please. We're getting good questions here. Waiting for, I'm waiting for a question about somebody saying that we should, the, the benefits and the positives of protesting loud and raucously in the street um, without a permit. Yeah, well, why don't you speak to that? Because somebody just cleared the chat. I can't believe it. Well, I, I, <laughs> so I, I lost I, the questions I was waiting I'm for. I'm in the debate on that. Uh, but from my personal experiences, from what I've seen, it's, it's turning people off when you march in the street without a permit. You really tie up traffic. People walking on the sidewalks are scared. I've seen it. And the mainstream media is streaming that out right to the public and showing how disruptive this movement is. I don't see anything positive. And I can understand there's a lot of feelings of anger and frustration, and I understand that. And you can take that out with a march in the street and say, darn it, I'm going to march in the street, I'm going to exercise some rights, I'm going to scream and shout. But there's one thing we all have to do. We have to keep our eye on the goal. Everything we do has got to directly translate into what is best for the goal of this movement. And the goal to me, and I think many other occupiers would uh, agree with basically, is getting corporate America out of our lives, out of the political realm, and have them just deal with their businesses and have nothing to do with decisions in our lives. And I think that can be a goal that almost every occupier can relate to because it, it's such a big umbrella. And so we have to say, okay, we may have to be patient. We may have to vent our anger some way, some different uh, way than shouting in the streets. But if it, it is for the best of the movement, and if it's for the best of the movement, we have to make those sacrifices. Um, thank you for, for filling that time and pointing that out, because that's a good, that's always been one of my concerns is like, I don't, I, I don't think we, we have good intentions. Sometimes our presentation is off. You know, yeah, because I, 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 I'm wanting to win people I over. I especially understand that after this, the last election where all these young people, they were told for years you have to work in the system, work within the system. And they did for Obama. They were out there knocking on doors. They were calling on telephones. I myself participated in that. They were giving their five dollars that they had for lunch and going without lunch to send it to the campaign. This was a major grassroots action. And what did they get by working in the system? They got a liar and they got betrayed. So that also builds into their animosity, their anger. And so it's totally understandable all the anger these participants in the Occupy movement have. I understand it. I get it. Yeah. We just need to channel our rage effectively. Exactly. Yep. Um, can you estimate the percentage of officers that totally believe what they're doing is morally correct 
as related to suppressing rights through intimidation. So um, does that question make sense? I can parse it out. If oh, you yeah, no, the, okay. question, the question makes absolute sense. Okay. But they're asking me for a percentage of those officers that feel that way. And here I have had no conversation with officers. Okay. I have no idea what they're thinking. They don't come up and talk to me. And I don't talk to them. I don't uh, initiate any conversation because I know for the most part, officers don't care for what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I have no real feel for what the officers are feeling. Okay. Um, uh, somebody asks about your struggles around your pension. Do you have legal assistance helping you? Has it come to that yet? I don't have legal assistance because I, I'm very on, believe I'm on very firm ground that they cannot touch my pension. Okay. They're only using that to scare me off because they knew that is the one hot button that I'd probably respond to and, and get the heck out of this movement. But they failed, and now they have nothing else to go to. Um, but I appreciate the concern of that, that uh, person. Right. Um, are th uh, A question, are there more people like you on police departments nationwide? And if so, would you consider creating a police in favor of the Occupy Movement Front or something like that. What was the last part of that question? Um, they they want to know, are there more police, police or retired policemen like you? That's question one. And have you ever considered creating a police s supporting Occupy Movement Front or group? Yes, I would have. Well, first of all, let's answer the first part of that question. I am not aware of any other police that uh, are supportive of me. I have not had one police officer from anywhere come up to me. Uh, well, that's wrong. An NYPD officer did walk past me and whisper in my ear, uh, keep up what you're doing. But other than that, I have had no outpouring, uh, not even a trickle of support from law enforcement officers. And subsequently, there's not a real uh, need for, any, for me to organize uh, an organization for police officers who support the movement, because I have had no one come up to me uh, stating such. So you'd be an organization of one. <laughs> of one. <laughs> um, another viewer wants to know what can viewers, like we watch these live streams, correct, do when we witness police abuse of occupiers during a live stream? Is calling the police departments and the mayor's offices and stuff, and is that effective, or is there other things that we could do? No, primarily the most important thing you can do is document it. The most important document documentation is with the video camera. The video camera is the, the, most, the ultimate weapon in sh defending your case of brutality. Subsequently, you want to make sure that you not only have the video, but you also write down the uh, officer's number, uh, badge number, and also his name, and also a physical description. If you can't get the badge number and the name, get a physical description of that officer, and then make sure the one who's being brutalized gets that information. And also have a copy of that information to hand into the legal association that you're working with. I can't stress that enough. Every Occupy has to be working with a legal organization because that's where it goes to court, and that's the only thing that's going to stop a lot of this is major lawsuits where the city has to pay out millions of dollars for their acts of brutality. So it's um, like using using the system against the system. Yes. Okay, great. It, it can be done, but again, that's something that in, requires patience. Right. And as we all know, the younger you are, the less patience you have. Uh, as you get older, I think you become more patient because you understand patience is part of the process. So again, I can understand where this generation is lacking a little on the patience they, because they see the, the, the problems are so egregious and they want them solved right away. Unfortunately, that's, that's going to lead to disappointment. You have to realize it's going to take some time. Okay. Have you noticed a change in police from enforcing the laws to just following orders? The officers believe they are enforcing the law. There's not, I doubt there's many officers out there that think they are violating the law. They may be. They may very well be, but in their minds they think they're enforcing the law 
and then therefore they're willing to follow the command of their supervisors. Okay, and we're turning the chat back on now that I've caught up, so we'll get a few more questions in. Um, how, how are you doing, sir? We're I know we're we're firing them at you right and left. I'll go have a drink of ice. Okay, yeah, do that while we're waiting for the next questions to roll up. Okay, we have a question from a viewer who has two two sons on the police force. One is an officer in Virginia Beach, and the other is a detective in Norfolk. And she's asking, do you have any advice for her as a mom? Yes, I would let her know to talk to her sons about if they incur the Occupy movement. Uh, I would like her to let her sons know what this movement is about and that it's a movement that includes them, that is concerned about them. And most importantly, I'm going to ask that mother to make sure her sons watch Inside Job. If her sons watch Inside Job, they'll fully understand the Occupy movement and support it. Excellent. There that's how strong, that's how strong that documentary is. Let me just give you one other quick story on that. I had a, a retired New York fireman come up to me while I was demonstrating in Zuccotti Park. He disagreed with me in the movement 100%, but we had a very respectful conversation. Even though we disagreed 100%, we were respectful of each other, and he, when he was willing, uh, ready to walk away, I said, excuse me, but would you do me one thing? Would you watch Inside Job? And it's available, Vimeo. He said, okay, I'll do that. Two weeks later, I see him coming back, walking towards me. Very solemn look on his face. He approaches me, he puts out his hand, he shakes my hand, and he says, I am so, so sorry. I never knew. And then he just walked away. He walked away ashamed that he, and embarrassed. But this man had no, did not have to feel ashamed because I felt the same thing. I believed in mom. Uh, the ap apple pie and the American flag for years and years. I didn't, had no idea this stuff was going on. So I was a victim of society. I mean, of corporate America. He was a victim. And that's nothing to feel ashamed about. And if anything, this man had a lot of courage to come back and tell me that. Mm -hmm. He could have watched Inside Job, felt this embarrassment, felt this shame, but never come back and tell me. This man came back, apologized to me, and walked away. And if he's watching now, you, sir, have nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, you were very courageous. So, Mom, tell your two sons to watch that documentary. Um, that's a great answer. I, I love it. And a great anecdote there. And, and how wonderful is it when people – I respect people who own their positions. You know, even if I don't agree with them, if they own them and take responsibility for them and, and are willing to be open-minded, there's nothing more you can ask of a person. There's nothing more Absolutely. you can ask from a person. Absolutely. Um, there's a question on the topic of resistance because we touched on that a little bit, and you indicated that resistance was was probably not productive. And this person makes a good point, um, asking about uh, what about the actions of Martin Luther King and the Freedom Riders? Wasn't that resistance and wasn't it effective? Okay, I perhaps I I misinterpreted and I, I asked, answered wrongly with resistance. I was basically answering a response to physical, violent resistance, okay. that you're putting up a fight. Uh, civil disobedience, where you are acting civil and allowing yourself to be arrested, absolutely, that I have no problem with that whatsoever. Okay. It was the physical fighting of the police in resisting arrest. The only thing I do have a problem with, though, I have a problem with, and this is debatable, I see there's some pros and cons on this. But my particular view is when you do get arrested for civil disobedience, do not go limp. Stand up. Let the officer tell the officer, I respect what you're doing. I know you have to do it. I am not going to make your job any harder. I will walk over. Making the police officer's job harder by making them drag you and have two and three officers carry you. No, you're making an enemy out of them and you're you're really giving the protest then a bad image. OK, um, a, a good, good point, you know, to to own your position but not complicate the others because it yeah. I how do you feel about this is a question for me um, I think a very effective tool is establishing the the more contrast you can establish 
the more effective of a communication tool it is. So when the, the police are being really aggressive and just completely out of control, the more control you can be in, then the greater the contrast and, and then reasonable people. My, my, my 80-year-old mother saw this and she said, well, that's just not right. <laughs> You you know, but yeah. it takes a I mean a lot of courage, and I don't know I mean I don't know if I'd be able to do it, but the ability to create contrast in those situations is an effective tool. That's why civil disobedience is very effective, and but if you if you make their job harder and just go limp, then it's sort of like well look at that he's making the officer's job harder and they're going to have to grab him perhaps harder they're going to drag him. And the, the blame here is put on the uh, individual protester. The police are not blamed as being overly aggressive when they're dragging somebody away. So you're really defeating your purpose. Okay. Um, another question. Do police generally know the laws that they're required to enforce or to converse in those laws? It appears at these, dem at these uh, demonstrations, particularly Anaheim, that they don't. They're firing into crowds to disperse the crowd. What for? First of all, why are you trying to disperse a protesting crowd? You have them there. They're in one place. Why do you want to send all these protesters into different streets, down different uh, avenues, when you have them all there and you can observe them very easily? And you never use any type of weapon except for two reasons, to protect uh, an, uh, someone's life from death or serious bodily injury or to pr uh, protect uh, property from being severely destroyed. Subsequently, there is no reason to be firing these rubber bullets or bean bags or pepper balls into a crowd. What are you protecting? This is where the training comes in. This is where the lack of supervision comes in. It appalls me when I saw that in Anaheim. And lack of accountability, too, because they, they are doing it without compunction. There, I, I would be surprised if any of those officers firing into that crowd are going to be... Uh, come up for any type of trial. Um, Departmental trial I'm talking about. Right. Within the department, forget outside in the criminal justice system. Yep. Just departmental violations. Yeah, and then so how do we respond to the community? See, you know, there's a good example right there. Um, you know, we're encouraging people to work within the system to do this, to do that. And, and so, but you right there just admitted the likelihood of any kind of accountability being held is pretty pretty slim so what is within a citizen the, to do within, within the department okay it's very level of accountability is very slim within the department okay that's why you have to have these civilian review boards and that's why if you don't have one yet you have to get one set up so you make it a civil issue absolutely okay and then you also the other issue you make it is a legal issue on your own you file your own criminal complaint through your the legal system that you're associated with um, you, okay, I'm going to ask this question because that would take generally some resources. A lot of these people don't have resources. What is their avenue? Protesting, having 100, 200 people outside the mayor's office, outside the city council's office, on a, as often as possible until you get the results you want. Flooding the telephone of these council people, because if they constantly get phone calls, the, uh, their other constituents that have problems that they want addressed will not be able to get through. And these council people will know that their other constituents are not being able to get through. They're losing votes. And the one thing a council person wants to do is get reelected. He doesn't want his tone, phones tied up. So constantly call. You can call five, six times a day, and you have five or 600 people calling tying up the phone lines, his wife can't even get in, and uh, you're going to have somebody is going to respond to your complaints. That's a good point. My dad used to say, you never want to annoy somebody with time on their hands. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I can call five times a day. <laughs> yeah. um, and I've done that. Yeah. Uh, here's a good question. How can the people of Occupy, the protesters, reach out to the police during their demos or their actions? Very effectively. The, every person can go up to the police, and I tell the protesters, talk with the police in a very civil manner. 
and they say, well, I don't know what to say to them. What would I say to a cop? I have no idea. Well, everybody has something to say to the police officer. And that is you can tell the officer why you are there. And many times it's a heartfelt story. Many times it's got to tug at the heart of the officer. And even though they will not look at you many times, they will have that stoic look and they will not even be they will be looking away from you, but they will hear you. And you've got to present yourself as civil as a person with feelings and why you're there. If they, they, they hear these stories, then they contradict the people that tell them that you're only out there to cause trouble. You only want handouts. In their minds, they say, well, wait a minute now. I heard that many people tell me many different stories why they're out there. <laughs> and they have nothing to do with wanting handouts. Okay, that's, that's great. I mean, just have a conversation, a one-to-one -one human conversation. But don't, well, it's not necessarily going to be a conversation. Well, they yeah. <laughs> don't be upset with that. And don't be discouraged by that because they are listening to you. And after you're done telling the officer why you were there, say thank you for listening. And, and that's it. And, and, you, and you, you can even see this is what I mean by creative protesting. Uh, I'm not seeing any new types of activity at these protests. You can have a line of like 30 people and they can, it's, they can be just go and be going down in front of a police line because those officers are there. They cannot move. So you have a captive audience. And that the people can just go down and each one they can tell their story to. And you have 20 or 30 people doing that. You affected those officers. Believe me, if that's done in a very civil, heartfelt way, you reach those officers. I'm not saying how much, but you definitely reach them better than shouting F the police. Um, a great, great point. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of storytelling and story sharing, so that resonates with me. Um, actually have one viewer that says that there is a organization called Occupy Police on Facebook and that they chimed in to let them know they support you. So um, we'll, we'll help you chase that down. Um, somebody asked, would you consider coming and speaking at Occupy Oakland? At Occupy Oakland? Yes. I certainly would. But the, the problem here is uh, finance. Right. I have had many invitations all over the country, but they just, uh, I'm bound financially. Mm -hmm. What I am working on, and this is in the early stages, is to come up with some financing from some wealthy individuals. I'm not looking for occupiers to be financing it, but some wealthy uh, individuals to finance a, uh, a trip that I could t hook up with uh, Occupy the Roads. Mm -hmm. That's a woman who has a uh, motorhome and she travels around the different Occupy sites. She invited me to join her. And if I can come up with the funding, I will travel this country from site to site with her. Excellent. Um, when you when you get to a point where there's fundraising involved, you know you need to let everybody know so we can help promote that because I think it would be be good. Um, and you know it's very commendable of you to recognize the limited resources of most people involved with Occupy. So, but the there are people out there that are generous and will support that are able to. Um, they they will. <clears throat> Excuse me. They will. But I'm looking for the wealthy people that they know what's right. And they're sitting on millions and millions, if not billions of dollars. I don't want to mention names, but there's a lot of big stars out there who have a lot of money. And they talk the talk, and I'm going to ask them to walk the walk. Excellent. Well, good for you. That's awesome. Um, there's a question here. Uh, a fairly large amount of people seem to think that the Occupy movement is dead. What are, you thoughts, what are your thoughts on that, and what difference do you think we have made up to now? Well, I know the Occupy movement is far from dead from my Facebook pages and the requests, uh, the abundance of requests I receive to go to different Occupy events. What is basically over with is the actual physical occupying of sites and sleeping out overnight, night after night. Yes, that served its purpose. I don't see how that would be any uh, beneficial to the movement to continue to sleep out at these sites. It was extremely important to start this movement, and it did. It worked. It accomplished its goal. Now the movement is going into different parts of the communities, 
and they are having different events. They are building up uh, chapters of occupiers in all different cities to handle different problems within communities. And if anybody has any doubt, uh, go to my Facebook and you'll see in numerous events of occupiers all over the country. Okay. Um, somebody wants you to become the National Director of Police Integrity which I think is a good idea. I could get behind that campaign. Um, there's a question about do police officers as part of the academy have to complete uh, political science courses on constitutionalism or, or things of that nature? Yes, there, there are courses uh, on the law and the Constitution taught at the police academy. Uh, unfortunately, many of the students are not uh, wide awake during those classes because they can become a little dry. But yes, that is definitely taught in the police academy when I was there in Philadelphia. Okay, um, here's, a, here's a question that sometimes comes up. Do you think occupiers should vote? Yes, I do. Oh, it's a very hard thing. I, I personally cannot vote, put, place a vote for Obama. I am so disappointed in him. I mean, I literally cried at his inauguration. I, I thought this man was going to change things. I was, I'm very cynical about politicians. For years, I heard their promises. For years, I was disappointed. But I actually bought into Obama hook, line, and sinker. And I have been so disappointed that I cannot place a vote for him. I will be voting for Jill Stein for president and Sherry Honkala for vice president of the Green Party. Well, there, there you go. That was a, a lot of people dance around that question. I like your concision with that. Thank you. Um, um, somebody's asking, are you aware of the more, more or less complete media blackout by mainstream media? And I think this person was on late because you spoke to that earlier, uh, mainstream media and how it treats Occupy and the movement for social justice. Yeah, there, there was just recently, just last Saturday, there were 5,000 people in Washington, D.C., and these were mainstream Americans, 5,000 people marching against this fracking movement. It's the fracking movement is where they go down into the earth to get the gas up, and it creates poison water and all kind of problems. 5,000 mainstream Americans marching, and not one mainstream media outlet handled it. Um, we have... A person is saying, um, would you ask Captain Lewis if he is still willing to protest and demonstrate with us? Oh, I'm constantly doing that. I am constantly protesting, and I have my sign. I always have my sign to understand us watch Inside Job, because to me that's the most educational documentary I can advertise. All right, and I'm going to get one more question, and then we're going to wrap it. Uh, if Brent is still here, he can he can ask it. And while we're waiting for him to throw it up, uh, see that's just a commentary. There. Oh, here's Punk Boy. Does Captain Lewis know about the financial situation in Scranton, PA? Um, we've heard heard the money. This the city is running out of ma money and you know holding off paying city workers. I. I think I just touched on it. They were thinking of reducing the pay to minimum wage of city workers, uh, if that is, is Scranton. I heard one uh, city in northern Pennsylvania was going to decrease the pay to police officers to minimum wage due to the drastic financial problems they were facing. And hopefully something like that would definitely wake up those police officers. Right, because they're, they're going from their salaries down to minimum wage just as an arbitrary governmental uh, decision. And, and Punk Boy actually says it, it might be a good time for them to officially join the movement, which is kind of what we've been talking about the whole night. If they don't join now, I don't know what could make them join. If that doesn't get them going. Okay, and um, I'm going to give this one out for the, the last question of the evening. I think it's good. Um, do you think that Homeland Security is running the police departments and not the mayors? The Homeland Security Department is extremely involved in what the police departments are doing, yes. Okay, that was a pretty clear, 
clear and concise question. So um, I'm going to, uh, Ping, I can answer that offline. I want to go ahead and wrap this and let Captain Lewis go. He's been on with us for an hour and a half. And I want to thank you for the time you've spent and the energy you've put into this. Um, you folks should know that Captain Lewis and Mrs. Lewis have been diligently working to um, make this a great interview, and I'm grateful for it, uh, for your time, your energy, the just all your investment in the movement and trying to get the word out and and support, you know, the causes for social justice. Um, we have a lot of people who are giving you know positive comments and expressing their thanks. Um, and I will go out on a limb and say if anybody wants to post some questions, we will. I'll copy the chat and then I'll I'll email them to Captain Lewis, get the responses, and then I'll post them for you guys. How's that? You know, no, that's, fine. That's, that's fine with me. Okay, so Z, if you can talk that up while I wrap, that'll be good. Um, but thank you so much for your evening. Thank you for your service, your observations, your opinions, and your willingness to have an open mind. Mark, I have to thank you just as much as you're thanking me, because without guys like you, my message doesn't get across. You don't see me on NBC, CBS, ABC, and you'll never see me on Fox. But it's the independent media, people like you, that are getting the message out. So my thanks to you is just as strong as your thanks to me. Well, we hope you have a good evening and that uh, um, things get resolved for you and hope you find that funder so you can go out and spread the message. And thank you for being here this evening. We really appreciate it. If you want to hold on for just a moment, then I'm going to wrap and archive this, and I'll speak to you offline. Uh